about uh, home improvement or a series that I started, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and then obviously was not here uh, to be able to continue with that. But this morning I am continuing in the home improvement area because how many of you know that the family needs to be strengthened? The family in and of itself needs to be strengthened. We need to realize what God's word says about the family unit, right? We all can improve, you know, at home, right? It's not just here at church, because the thing is, is that yes, we can hear a sermon every single week, but if we're not applying what we hear, if we're not applying what the Word of God says, then it's basically it's falling on, uh, you know, on deaf ears. You can say, oh, Pastor, that's a great message, or, you know, you know I, I understand what the Bible says, but if you don't do what the Bible says, then it's not going to help you, right? Right? Right. All right. Just to let you know that the medication that they had me on it has my vision a little blurry, so if I uh, stumble or fumble, it's because I'm blaming it on that. All right. My wife said it's okay. I'm not with that, but they said Genesis chapter 2, and then I'm also going to be in Psalm 127. And so as you're turning there, you know, some of you may be, you know, uh, you know out there a couple of weeks ago, and then uh, this morning you may be. You might be listening, you know, you're saying, I'm, the, I'm hearing these sermons, Pastor, but I'm wondering if there's anything here for me. You may think that since your children are grown and gone, that these messages do not touch your life. If you're single or living alone, you may believe that these sermons about the home and the family have nothing to say to you. No matter where you are in life, you still have family. The things, that, uh, the things that we're going to discuss today will apply to everyone here, whether you have children or not, or whether you're married or not. So, as we go to uh, Genesis chapter 2, this morning I want to talk to you for a few moments about a firm family foundation. A firm family foundation. Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse uh, 18, and I'm going to go through uh, verse 25 to the end of the chapter. The Bible reads at verse 18, it says, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto, unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every creature, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave, uh, gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of, of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help for him. And the Lord caused a, a deep, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took a, a one of his ribs and closed up uh, the flesh inside, uh, instead. Thereof, and the rib which the Lord had taken uh, from man made him a made him a woman and brought her unto the man. And he said, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man, a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both uh, naked, and the Lord uh, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this morning that we would learn from your word about to have a firm family foundation. And God, uh, I thank you, God, uh, for your word. What a blessing it is, Lord, uh, you know, that people say, well, there's not a manual for life, but yet... If we were to realize that, you know, and uh, whether we're saved or not, that the Word of God is the manual for life and how to live this life. And so, Lord, I pray that we would realize the truth of God's Word and that we would uh, apply it to our lives, that we would actually take what we hear and do those things, that we not just be hearers of the Word, but we would be doers of the Word as well. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your Spirit this morning. May I preach your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, you know, uh, going through there, so we're going to be talking about uh, what our families need in order to be strong in the Lord. Before we look specifically at our text, I want you also to turn over to, to Psalm 127. Now, I think this verse will prepare the way for uh, what I want to say today. This psalm is about the family, the importance 
of family and the importance of children in the family. The first part of this verse, what does it say? Uh, Psalm 127, verse 1. The Bible says, Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, uh, waketh but in vain. And so we begin to see this, this whole part. It says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Right? Psalm 127 is in a series of psalms which bears the subscription, uh, a song of degrees. There are 15 of these song, uh, song of degrees uh, right in the middle of the book of Psalms. What's interesting is that it's in the, uh, that in the middle of these songs of degrees is a song that has to do with family. I think that, that it reminds us of the centrality of the family and the importance of the family. That unless God builds that house, you're going to labor in vain. Unless God builds your family, you're going to labor in vain. That's why oftentimes if you are doing things that is apart from the, the Word of God, your family has turmoil. Your family is going to have a hard time you know, going against it. Why? Because you're laboring in vain. You're not allowing God to build it. And this applies, uh, you know, obviously, to, you know, to, to save people. Because why? We're reading God's Word. God's saying, you know what? We need to let the Lord build house. You say, well, how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to talk about that uh, this morning. You and I know that, uh, that a nation that is, uh, a nation is only strong as the families that make up the nation. What is, what are politicians, what is TV, what is all these different, you know, uh, mediums trying to do? They're trying to deteriorate or rip apart the American family, the, you know, the biblical family. How many shows do you watch where the husband, the man of the house, is shown as being an idiot or a moron or incompetent? Because the man is supposed to lead the house. He is the leader of the house, Right? Some of you, you know, that maybe have been watching too much TV, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, some ladies may say, you know what? No, I don't need a man. Yes, you do. If you want to have a family, He's like, no, I don't. Yes, you do. Yeah. God's word, you know, has you know, husband, wife, and then the children. That is, uh, that is the order that God has 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 placed it. And so we see a nation right now that is in utter turmoil. Why? Because the family unit is being attacked, deteriorated, and being destroyed and demolished, according to them. We also know that a church is only as strong as the families that make, uh, that make it up. So the placement of this song is obviously very important. If we don't have strong families, we're not going to have a strong church. Make sense? If we don't have a, you know, a, a strong family, the church will suffer as well. And I believe that you're seeing the American church suffer tremendously. Another thing I noticed is that as I looked through, uh, through the Songs of Degrees, is that most of them just say a Song of Degrees. But four of these songs say a Song of Degrees of David, indicating that perhaps David is the one who wrote that song. This song is different. It says at the beginning of that song, a song of degrees for Solomon. Mm -hmm. Now I think that it is important that we look at that because why? Because it says at the beginning of it, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. What was Solomon in charge of? He was in charge of building the temple. His father was not allowed to. He was the one that was allowed to. So he knew something about building. Um, that we know, we know he was a great king, and obviously he's the son of, uh, of he's the son of King David. The thing which, uh, you know, like I said, uh, characterized his administration was the fact that he was selected to be the one to build the, uh, the the temple in the Old Testament. Solomon was a man who stood, who understood building. He understood what was involved in building. For instance, Solomon would surely understand the building. That building is, is hard work. I think that we have some here in this uh, in this room this morning that understand that building is a hard work. Even if the fact is that you've been watching somebody in your family build, you know it's hard work, right? Right, Tim? Tim knows a little bit something about building. First, you know, you know and so we need to understand. So what do you know, So I, I would hope that we would agree that it is hard work also to build a good marriage. 
It's hard work, work to build a good family, right? It's not something that just magically happens, right? It's something that takes hard work. It's hard work to build a business, right? Businessmen know how hard it is. It takes long hours. It, it takes financial sacrifice. It, it takes extensive training if you are going to build a good business. If it takes all that time and effort to build a business, we should not think for a minute that somehow marriage and family are going to just automatically work and it's not going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of work. I think Solomon also would understand that it, uh, that it is important that you have a good general contractor. Do you want a, a contractor that cuts corners? I, I know of you that have. And it always costs you more in the long run. That's why when I find a good contractor, I stick with them. Because they're hard to find nowadays. There's so many people that want to cut corners because you know what, they can make more money and everything, uh, and everything else. So what it ends up causing you is more money and more heartache on, on those things. So when you find a good contractor, keep them. Don't let them go. Now, uh, now in the Old Testament, Hiram was a general contractor for the temple in the Old Testament. That's who Solomon had built uh, the temple in the Old Testament. Obviously, he's a very capable contractor. I don't think Solomon's going to you know, hire a guy that's going to cut corners on those things. And if you're going to build a family, it is important, again, like I said, to have that good contractor. And remember, it says, except the Lord build the house. You can't build a marriage, and you can't build a family unless Jesus Christ is the general contractor. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. Jesus was, you know, obviously we know Jesus was a carpenter while, uh, while he lived here on earth, and he is involved today in uh, three very important building projects. He is involved in building a home for our future, right? A place in heaven. John chapter 14, it said, he said, I go prepare a place for you. In Matthew 16, he said, uh, he said, on this rock, I'll build my church. He's involved in, in, in building that, uh, you know, in, in building this church. Do you want a church that is not built upon Christ? Unfortunately, we have many that are not built upon Christ. They're built upon man's opinion. He also is interested in building a home for the family. Psalm 127, except the, the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that will why, Pastor, why do you keep on bringing that verse up? Because I want you to understand, unless the Lord builds your house, unless the Lord builds your family and your marriage, you will labor in vain. You will have all kinds of issues. You see, it's over here going, that's why. You understand me, you're going, that's why I'm having a hard time in my, in my marriage and in my family. Why? It's because I'm building it upon man's opinion. I'm building it upon maybe my parents' opinion or somebody else that I saw or something else that happened in my life. That's how I'm building it. And you're not going to God's word to learn what God's word has to say about having a successful marriage and family. As I said earlier, it takes hard work. There's there's no, uh, you know, when we look at this, somebody says, you know what, if I could just just take a pill one day and my family was just poof, amazing, I would do it. If there was just a how-to manual, there is a how-to manual. It's called the Word of God. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Men, because I've heard of this, that men, for some odd reason, when they get to building, they feel like they may not need to use the instruction manual. <laughs> men, you need to read this instruction manual. <laughs> Don't cut corners. Don't say, you know, I got the gist of it. I don't want the gist. I want the one that knows about it. Because why? Because God is the one who instituted marriage and he instituted the family. And so as we begin to look at, go back and, and look at Genesis chapter 2, those verses that I read, we will see how a firm family foundation, sorry, a uh, firm family foundation is built. And I want to give you uh, give some basic building blocks upon which we can build that firm family foundation. Number one is this. A God-oriented foundation. A God-oriented foundation. Look at verse 18. It says, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help I will make him a help me for him. That verse teaches uh, you know teaches us that in order to have a good family 
Uh, you have to have a God-oriented foundation. God has to be number one. You have, and I'm saying this, you know, I'm just saying this, men, you have to read God's word. You have to. I think this is one of the big reasons why, and, and I'm not saying this as a, you know, as a put down, but I think that there's a reason why there's more women in church than there is men. Is because men are usually going to church and they're usually bashed. That men are absolutely horrible. I'm not saying that. I'm saying men, you need, I'm encouraging you, read God's word. If you want to be able to lead your family well, you need to read the Bible every day. You need to. It's not a fact of, you know, the pastor's just being mean. Men, you are the leader of the house. You need to read God's word every single day. And I would venture to say you need to read God's word more than you read uh, the, uh, the evening newspaper, and you need to read it more than you watch TV. You say, well, Pastor, what about what if I watch my favorite preacher on TV? It's not the same thing as reading God's word. Well, what happens if I go out and I read something? You know, like I need to read about how this verse is interpreted by everybody else. No, you read. Why? Because God wants you. You know, he wants to talk to you. He doesn't want you to read some commentator or somebody else's idea. If God's word says something, how many of you know that man's opinion does not matter? If God speaks to you on it and says, hey, this is what this verse means, you know what? Obviously, you check it against God's word and you go back and forth. You know what? There's been many a times where I've looked at a commentator and I'm going, that's not even what that verse is saying. I'm not saying that all commentators are bad or horrible, but you always need to go back to the word of God. You always need to. Because the thing is, is a commentary is a man writing his opinions on that verse. And they could be completely wrong. Or the fact of getting a devotional. I know that's, and I've talked about this, people say, well, Pastor, the devotional helps me. It only helps you understand how it spoke to somebody else. And who says that that, uh, that devotional you're reading, that that person's even a believer? You could go to a Christian... And I'm just, you know what, I'll just flat out tell you, you can go to a Christian bookstore, get a book or a devotional, and that person's not even saved. You say, well, it's a Christian book. It doesn't matter. You know what, they will, you know, they'll sit there and go through, you know, whatever, and the biggest thing nowadays with Christian bookstore, Christian music, Christian whatever, is how much money it makes. It doesn't matter, you know, whether or not it's biblical. You say, well, I watch Christian movies. Whatever makes the most money. You say, well, it's Christian. Does, you, can label, you can put a Christian label on it, does not mean that, you know, that it's Christian. If it goes against God's word, it goes against God's word. You know what? When you, read, uh, when you listen to a song on Christian radio, make sure that you're actually singing songs that actually are biblical. There's one song you know, that, you know, uh, that I heard on there that says, you, know, you have never failed me yet. Is that biblical? No. What it should say is that you have never failed me. And you never will. Because God will never fail us. But the fact that they put the yet on there what causes what? Doubt that there's possibility in the future that God will fail you. And I'm like, well, the song is great. I don't care you know, if the whole song is wonderful and there's one line in there that's wrong. It's still wrong. I mean, how much impurity does it take to make water impure? I used the analogy a few years ago of taking a bottle of water and just putting a small, teeny, tiny amount of dog feces in it. It's only a small amount. It's only like 1%. I mean, the rest of it's pure, right? Would you drink it? Then why would you sing something that is not pure, you know, that is not God's word. Why would you read something that is not God's word? Why would you, that, that's one of the reasons, like, you know, reason, like, when I read a, a Christian book, and this is a tangent, I'm telling you right now, but this is not in my notes. When you read a Christian book, I can sit there and say, you know, look at that and say, you know, well, that's good. But then I need to take it to God's word. Everything needs to go back to God's word. Everything. Whether it be music, you know, God's, you know, 
you always have to go back to whatever I watch on TV, because you know, as much as I love Andy Griffith, there's some of the stuff on Andy Griffith that's flat out wrong. You say, well, Andy Griffith? I mean, how could he get it? He gets it wrong a lot of the time. It's funny watching Martin. <laughs> you, everything needs to be brought back to God's Word. Everything. The key, uh, the key phrase in, in verse 18 is this. I will make. The first family was formed by God. God said, I will make. It wasn't man who was making. It, God said, I will make. He, he's the one who started the first family. He's the one who started marriage. And it was founded upon his power and sanctioned by his authority that you have an adequate authority for your family. If God is, the, you know, God should be the number one person in your family. He should be. He needs to be. Every family is built upon some source of authority. There is some basis by which you build your family. By, by which you make decisions for your family. By which you determine the value system of your family. There are basically two directions you can turn to when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, to what will be your source of authority in your family. One place is that you can turn to culture. You can see how culture has a family. That's a messed up way to go, I'll tell you that right now. You can turn to the culture in which you have been brought up, or the culture which surrounds you today. Most people, when they establish a family, draw from the, family of, from the values and the standards of their previous family. Meaning who? From your parents. They tend to build their own family and, and make it like the family in which they grew up in. And he goes, you may say, well, Pastor, hold on a second. Are you, are you speaking bad about my family? No. But they don't know. Your family could have been godly. You know, uh, could have, you know, went to church every single week. Could have been, you know, reading the Bible every day together and everything else. But they are still not God's word. They are still not God's word. For many people, you know, like I said, it could be a good thing if you had a Christian mother, mother and father. And they love the Word of God, and they love the Lord, and that they taught you the Bible and Bible, you know, Bible morality, and taught you to, to love Jesus and love one another. Then you have a marvelous family heritage, right? That would be a good foundation on which to possibly build your family. Why? Because everything was built upon the Word of God. They be uh, they be God the center of it. Of course, it, it is a sad thing that there are some children who who have these godly families. And they reject the godly values that they were taught by their parents and their previous family and go in the other direction. We see this all the time. Well, you know, and oftentimes it's, it's been badly characterized as always the preacher kid or the deacon's kid. I'm doing everything, you know, I'm trying to do everything possible in my life that my family is not the statistic. Because you always hear about how they, you know, well, they, they used to go to church and they used to do all these things, but now they turned away. But I can tell you that there is a deacon's kid in this church that turned out pretty well, my wife. So don't sit there and say that all deacons, you know, all deacons kids are just horrible, you know, and their kids are horrible. My wife, you know, <coughs> is out there in the fact of being a deacon's kid. And I think she turned out pretty well, right? <laughs> But not every uh, every situation, you know, not every situation happens like that. Or you know, uh, the other way would be that some people just model their family after what they grew up. And then, uh, like I said, obviously that might not be a good thing at all. For instance, if you if your family was built on materialism, meaning that if you didn't get something, that means you didn't love the other person. That can lead to a whole lot of things because then you have a lot of people, you know, in your family that are feeling bad when all of a sudden. Maybe uh, Christmas is not as big as it used to be because maybe Dad got laid off and couldn't afford it as much, right? If material possessions were the most important thing in the family, that's obviously a bad pattern to follow. If alcohol and drugs were in your family, that is a bad uh, pattern to follow. Does it bother you when you see a couple in a restaurant with small children and mom and dad are drinking alcohol probably? Well, Pastor, Bible says, a little drink. 
I don't see any of people taking a little drink. I've seen them taking a whole lot of drink. And chances are, those kids are going to grow up in an atmosphere of turmoil, of turmoil and conflict. One of the greatest tragedies of, of the American family today is the use of alcohol. Their choices have brought unforetold uh, sufferings upon them and the children that they raise. Because alcohol brings a whole kind, a whole a lot of other kinds of things in there, along with drugs and stuff like that, that is involved. It'll rip a, a family apart. Or maybe some families have nothing but fussing and quarreling and yelling in the home. If you saw family arguments and whoever yelled the loudest got the most violent and got the most violent one, then you may uh, perpetuate in that uh, in that in your own family. If that's all you ever saw, then you would uh, think that that's the way to do it. But it is a, a, a poor pattern to follow. It may be the, the culture from which you came. And others find their source of authority in the culture around them. They have been brainwashed by the culture. You say, I've never been brainwashed. You have been brainwashed. If you're watching TV, and you know what, and I say this to, you know, to my different, you know, I watch you know, TV. You're being brainwashed by whatever message that they're sending. That they're sending. Because the thing is, is that the standards of the so-called celebrities of our day is to serve as a basis for their own standards. The celebrities nowadays, and even back in, you know, back in the time, you know, back in the 50s and 60s and all that, were not necessarily the best to follow. They may have been great on the show. I was actually I was getting my hair cut this button off past week. Because I was looking pretty shaggy. I felt like I was a hermit for a little while. As you can tell, my beard is shorter too. But as I was in there and they were watching TV, you know, they had the TV on in there. It was just bad stuff all over the place. And the thing is, is that all of a sudden, you know, I just kind of popped my eyes up. And there was a man on there that I watched on another show that's considered to be a family wholesome show that doesn't have all that bad stuff, but he was on the show with all the with all the uh, the bad stuff and all the, the you know the violence and you know cussing and swearing and all this stuff, all this junk that was on this one show. He was in that show, but then he's over here in another show that's supposed to be a family oriented show. So don't think that you know just because you're watching a show that that person on there, you're going, oh man, they're a good moral person. No, they're, they are actors and they are wanting to make money wherever they can get it. Whether it's on a family show or whether it's on a converted show. I mean, the media elite in America today are making a concerted effort to destroy family life as we know it, right? And as the family life ought to be. The culture is destroying everything in its power to undermine and to destroy the biblical foundation of family. The standard in today's culture is like, let me see here, the Kardashian. It's the Simpsons. You know the Simpsons have been on for like 25 plus years controlling the culture? Things like South Park. And some of you are wrong. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Why? Because you've been desensitized to it. I told you before that when, you know, uh, this was probably about, I must be about 20, 25 years ago, that I had decided, you know, when I felt like the Lord was saying, you know what, just take a, you know, take a fast from watching TV for 30 days. And if you feel like the Lord is telling you to do that, I, I suggest that you do it. Because you will come back and all of a sudden you will realize how desensitized that you were with the junk that is out there. If it's not the show you're watching, it's the commercials. Shows like Modern Family. They think that they can redefine how a family is. You have books out there, you know, uh, talking to your children about my two dads, my two moms, or Timmy has, you know, Timmy has two moms. Or you have the Drag Queen Story Hour. All this crap that's out there. You say, well, Pastor, you just said the C word. I'd rather say, you know, I'd rather say that, you know, the word crap, you know, the, the fact that you going out there and having your kids 
be uh, uh, groomed by a transvestite. By these, by these pedophiles going into a drag queen story hour and telling your kids about you know things that they should not be hearing about ever. People say, well, you know, it's their choice. Yeah, it, it was their choice, but their choice doesn't need to be pushed upon our kids. They made their choice. The Bible says that they gave them up, they gave them up, and they gave them over. That God gave them over. Why? Because they're the ones who chose it. But now they want your children. And if you don't think that the homosexual, the LGBTQIA+, plus whatever, because it's always updating, they are after your children. They are all pedophiles. They want your children. If you don't think the whole like, gender reassigning and gender surgeries and all that stuff is not wicked, it is wicked as hell. It is. I mean, any parent that says, you know, I think my child, I think my son, you know, wants to be a girl and then goes and then has their genitals removed when they're five and six years old, that parent should be slapped and should be not. You know what? I would say they should be, you know, the, the government should, and I'm just going to say, should put a bullet in their head. Amen. Doing that to a child? You've got to be kidding me. Do you ever hear a thing that kids like to play? play is called make believe? Just because they have that thought for a moment? Or the parent goes, you know what? I really wanted a daughter, but I got a son, so I'm going to start calling my son a girl. That's child abuse. Yeah. Yeah. That was great too. That was really <laughs> but it's, it's crazy the way that they're wanting to destroy the family and destroy lives. Yeah. If you're depending upon the government to sit there and, and be you know, your barometer for morality, I'm sorry, you're, you're going to be messed up. <laughs> You say, well, you're just going by that old ancient book that tells you all these things. No, I'm going also by biology that the Bible teaches as well. There is only two genders. Do you know, and this is something you know that just happened this past week, separate rank. That there's two states this past week that signed into legislation that you can't say anything anti-Semitic or you get thrown in jail. Two states. You say, well, it's got to be those liberal, those Democrat states. No, it's two Republican states. Hmm. South Dakota, you know, you know, uh, you know it was the Christie uh, Noble, which most, you know, which Donald Trump is planning, you know, is looking at for being VP. She signed it. It's like, oh, she's a great, you know, great governor. And then Georgia. That if. If I were in those areas, in those states, and I preach what the Bible says, if I say that the Jews killed Jesus, which is true, because the Bible says it in other history books and everything else, say it as well, not just the Bible, that that's anti-Semitic and you can get thrown in jail for it. Do not depend upon politicians to save you. They are not, they're out for their own best interests. And the veteran will go out to But one of the trends that we see among these so called celebrities is that for women to have babies and not be married. We see that all over the place, don't we? I said this before, I'll say it again. I've heard people say, I've heard women say, Well, I don't need I don't need a man to have a baby. Yes, you do. <laughs> they say, Well, I don't need a man, you know, I don't need to raise it. Well, you need it over you know, once at least. And then moms, you know, single moms wonder why it's difficult. Why? Because you should have a husband in the house helping you. Right? And not multiple husbands. There's so many times where there are there, there are single moms out there and they have kids by several men that are not husbands. And they say, well, you know, I'm tired. I, there's so much drama in my life. I wonder why. But you know what? The Bible says not to do that. Do you know why? Because the Bible, God cares for you. God doesn't want you to 
to have, you know, have you know, extra anxiety that that the situation creates. He wants you, you know, he wants, you know, man and woman to be married and then have a family. That's the way God designed it. If that offends you, tough. You miss me? But the end thing now is, that, like I said, is for these women to have babies and not be married is just to pick out a guy and have a baby. It's like the baby has become an accessory, like a piece of jewelry. It's like you have a diamond ring, you have a diamond necklace, now you have a baby on your side. But I can guarantee all those celebrities are not raising those children. They have other people doing it. And the only time they ever bring those kids out is for some red carpet event, like, oh, look at how great of a parent I am. If that is your source of authority, then you are headed for some difficult days in your life and in your family. I want to show you how to obviously how to build a firm family foundation. The way to do that is for that foundation to be God oriented. It means that God is number one. In verse 18 it says, and the Lord said, this is God talking. God is the one who is establishing the institution of marriage and, and the family. And he said, I will make. Marriage is a divine institution in which you hear those marriage vows. You know, in, in there, there's a marriage is a divine institution. Well, a family is a divine institution as well. There wasn't a bunch of cavemen around, you know, going around like, why don't, you know, why don't we just have a marriage and let, you know, let's just have a family. Marriage came from God. Family came from God. It was all God's idea. God's the one who put it together. You know, you can, like I said, you can learn from some books, you can learn from some marriage counselors, but the ultimate authority of what marriage is and what the family should be, is supposed to be is what God says in the Word of God that it's supposed to be. God has given us this book, and oftentimes we let it collect dust. And then we wonder why sometimes our families are that way. Number two. So, well, that was number one, though, you know. Point two. The God-oriented foundation. You need to have a goal-oriented foundation as well. Verse 24 of Genesis chapter 2 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. God gave Eve to Adam, and they were brought together as husband and wife, and married. Here is what Adam says, Therefore shall a, you know, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, which we just read, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Last week, a couple weeks ago, we talked about one plus one equals one, right? In marriage. I don't understand uh, husband and wife that have separate bank accounts. If you're one flesh, everything should be shared. Why all of a sudden? Well, he has his money, and she has her money, and it's just better that way. No, you're still separated. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be. You should have one, you should have one account. Now, I understand if you have a separate account because you're like, hey, I'm putting money in this account for bills, and I'm putting money in, in this account for vacation. You say, well, those are separate. No, those, everybody has access to those. Like mom and dad have access. Husband and wife have access to those. The goal here is oneness. The, the goal is togetherness. The goal in marriage and family is what? Unity. The goal is to leave and cleave. What does that mean? Is that when you get married, it's not obviously talking about you leaving, like, like sorry, mom, dad, I don't talk to you anymore. I shun you because the Bible said leave and cleave. And you, know, you need to get up out, you know, just go away. What it means is, is that when you're also when you're having Say you're having a, a disagreement. You don't go to mom and dad and say, well, he's being a jerk. And you go with whatever, whatever. You can go to your parents and say, you know what? This is kind of what's going on. What, are, you know, what advice? And your parents can give you advice. But the thing is, that what do you think your parents are going to do? They're going to take your side automatically. My child, my child will never lie to me. They will once the situation. Because they're only going to hear from their situation, their point of view. 
And it may not all be alive, but it's not it's gonna be skewed. Right? You can go to them for advice, but you know, parents, you should not be telling them how to live their life and how to run their marriage. They have to figure out how to do that on their own. Right? I mean, think about it. There's an illustration to have, and it's it's a good illustration, but it's kind of, you know, but if you think about it, it would be weird. So think about it on the good side, not the weird side, all right? <laughs> I don't, I'm just preparing this. But I read, you know, I read some time ago that when a man and a woman climb into a bed every night together, that there are six people who get in bed with them. There is the man and his father and mother, and there is the woman and her father and mother. Why? Because that's who they are basing everything off of. And so when there's a disagreement argument, you know, the wives are going to base everything about how their parents handled that situation, and the husband is going to base everything on how their parents did. Like I said, it's a good illustration of a word one, so don't think about it in the word way. But the thing is, is that all of your life, everything is going to be affected by, you know, by how the things were when you were growing up. That kind of thing. And you can change those things. Don't think that you can, you know, that, well, because my dad was an alcoholic, i got to be an alcoholic. I've heard that one. Or, you know, my mom was this way, so i got to do this. No, you can change those things. Why? Because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? But realize that oftentimes when you react a certain way, especially in those, those uh, higher tense moments, your parents are going to come out through you. If you don't watch it. Am I right? You may sit there and say, I don't ever want to be like my father. I don't ever want to be like my mother. She was but it's gonna come out. Every uh, every decision, you know, uh, on those so don't sit there and, and make those decisions and everything else based on those things. Here's another thing. When you get married, you need to clip the financial strings. If your husband and wife began to be like, Mommy, Daddy, can you take care of my car payment? You laugh, but then, you know, I've heard this before. Or, Mommy, Dad, can you take care of my insurance? Can you, take, uh, you, you, you can take care of my home bills. Mom, Dad. And the bad thing is, is that you have parents that will sit there and say, well, yeah, because they just need help, you know, getting off, you know, getting off their feet. If you, man, if you're not in a position to be able to not only sustain yourself, but your spouse, then you shouldn't get married. But I love them. Love seems to go away when your finances get in the way. Because then all of a sudden it's like, why did you go out and spend money on this or you know you, you didn't get my opinion? And people start arguing about finance. You know? Well you didn't have you shouldn't have went to, I'm not saying that you like you go to the other one like you know asking you know, like permission, oh wise master, please let me may I be able to you buy a bottle of water. I'm not saying that, but you should discuss your financial you know, you know the financial purchases that, that you make. Right? And have like maybe a certain amount that you say, you know what, I don't need approval for any little things. Like if your thing is like, you can go out and spend fifty dollars, and you, you know, doesn't need you, know, you don't have to talk to the other person. They kind of set it up that way. If you don't go out and say, I'm right, go spend a thousand dollars and never talk. I guarantee you that's an argument we're going to have. You need to talk to one another and communicate with one another, and teach your kids on how to spend money wisely. Right? If they don't learn from you, they're going to learn from the world. And I know that one of the hardest things, and one of the hardest parts of being a parent, and I dread this day, is to let the children go. Children need to leave, and mom and dad need to let them go. Let them live, uh, you know, live their life with their spouse. It's hard. I haven't done it. But just the thought of it brings me like sadness and, and, and whatnot. But I talk to others that you know that when their kid leaves, it's just you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? 
But you figure for at least 18 years of your life with that kid, you know, if you have more, then you have more. And, you know, like, so it could be like 25, 30 years of raising, you know, and you're like, that's been 30 years of my life. And they're gone. I mean, obviously they'll call you on the phone, but it's not the same. They'll come and visit from time to time, but it's not the same, right? What we need to realize, and I've said this before, is that in marriage we need to realize that husband and wife are basically incompatible. You say, well, then why do you marry? If we're getting incompatible together, why? Because Cecil Lothorn, you know, said this, said, the difficulty of achieving a happy marriage is compounded by the fact that men and women are basically incompatible. They have goals, they have needs, they have emotions and drives which are incompatible with those of the opposite. Realize that. Know that. Know that there's a reason why, you know, we're called, you know, it's, it, you know, we're called the opposite sex, right? Men, you know, you marry a woman, she is opposite of you. Women, you know that men is the opposite. My wife, I know in one area, she can sit there and her mind just goes. It does. It just goes on, on things like all the stuff she's got to do for the day, all these different things, what's going on at church and everything else, everything's going on. You go, come over to me and it's just like crickets. There's nothing going on up here. I'm just telling you, there, it's just nothing. And like my wife has come up to me at times, she says, what you thinking about? I'm like, nothing. She goes, oh no, really. You have to be thinking about something. Nope, nothing. And then she goes, really? And then I'll, I'll finally I'll go, well, now I feel like I should be thinking about something, because apparently I'm not. But I'm like, no, there's like crickets, there's nothing. I was like, well, if a thought comes in my brain, I'll, I'll let it out. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> but right now, I'm tapped out, there's nothing there. It's calm. I mean, am I the only one, man? <laughs> It's just one of those things where we're just going like, I'm tapped out, I got nothing. I'm good. I already everything's already came out, I'm good. And I sit there and I think about I think about the fact of uh, you know like comedian Tim Hawkins was talking about the fact that his wife gave him this super long like text message. Because he just said, he asked her, he goes, How are you doing today? Gave him a, she gave him a big long list and he ends up going, Okay. <laughs> That's all he had. That's all he had to do. He was tapped out on all that. Why? Because men are different, right? And women are different. We're doing over opposites of each other. But the same thing is true. Obviously, you know, when children are born, all of our children are different. Here, you know, you can have you can have two children, you know, who have the same mother and father, but they are total opposites. You know, one said, you know, we'll sit there and one will like to go outside and play, and the other one wants to stay inside and like work on stuff. Or, or some, you know, or some, you know, one of your girls like wants to play with dolls. The other one's like, I want to go below the doll. I mean, it's just something totally different. I mean, you know, on the opposite parts of those things, right? These are different, you know, all the way around. We need to realize, obviously, that our spouses are different from us, and our kids are going to be different. We can't sit there and say, well, you're going to be like this because I'm this way, so you got to be like this. So we need to realize with our kids is that we find what they like to do and we go along with it. Now. My daughter, I think about this, she loves ballet. She likes to, you know, do ballet, she likes to, you know, do all these things. I can't dance. At all. She's she see me, you know, I'll sit there and mess around, she's like, wow. And just like that, she starts laughing and giggling and whatever, because it's just like that, okay? The only thing I can kind of help her out with right now is that she's into softball. I can help her out with that, I'm like, woo, I'm right there with but I, you know, as far as all that other you know, I can't do, do something. But that doesn't mean that I shut down and I go, well, I'm not going to be a part of my daughter's life in that, in that way, because it, it, it doesn't pertain. No, I need to realize she's different, and she has different things that she likes to do, right? And don't worry, don't you worry, just because I've been sick, I haven't forgot about her daddy daughter day. Yeah. She didn't ask me, Dad, you're going to be able to do it once I'm better. I'll, you know, I'll be able to do it once I'm better. Well, some better. But these are all things that we need to realize and, and know that, you know what, Matthew 19 says what? What God has joined together, let no man put us under. You will have arguments. You will have disagreements. You will have those things. 
But I realized, as I said you know, earlier, you know, a few weeks ago, divorce should never be used as a trump card to get somebody to stop a conversation. I have heard of people in, in just knock out, drag out fights, and all of a sudden, they're like, you know, I'm leaving you. I want a divorce. And they, the conversation does stop. Why? Because that person never thought that that was ever going to be brought up. Don't do it. It says, what God has joined together. When you got married, you said, you know what? I am together for them to what? For better or for worse. And you're, don't sit there and you know, try and hide the fact at times that you have a disagreement from your children. Children need to realize, yes, there are disagreements. But they also need to see the fact of your, uh, of the fact of you coming back together, uh, you're back together and having forgiveness and reconciliation and saying, you know what? You know, I was wrong in this area. You know, can you forgive me? You know, for, for you know, oftentimes, you know, uh, you have people that will sit there and maybe talk about it, but very rarely do you have a spouse that will come back and say, can you forgive me or would you forgive me? That's huge. Because it's not just the fact that like, you're saying, you know, like, we're going to get past this. It's the fact that you, one thing, when you say, would you forgive me, you're putting yourself out there and saying, I want your forgiveness, I seek your forgiveness because I don't want, I want you to realize that I did wrong by you and I, I'm seeking that. And that needs to happen on both sides. It can't just be a one-sided thing. It has to happen on both sides. Obviously, you know, I'm talking to you, you know, about commitment. And that is the number one sort of requirement for a, for a strong family is commitment. When you are committed to your wife, that's the way. And lastly, and very quickly on this last one, is this a grace-oriented family. Number three is a grace-oriented family. Verse 25 says that they were, uh, full, uh, and they were both naked and the man and, uh, the man and the wife and were not ashamed. After, uh, after Genesis chapter 2, what comes next? Genesis chapter 3, right? Some of you are thinking, um, I don't know. Is this a trick question? But Genesis chapter 2 closes with with them being uh, naked and unashamed, right? But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, it says that Adam said to the Lord, I heard thy voice in the, uh, in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And for some of us, you know, you're already ahead of me, you know where this is headed, that in Genesis 3, we have the sad account of the first family and the entrance of sin into the family and into the human race. Man became a sinner. Eve became a sinner. Adam became a sinner. One of the things you have to understand to have a firm family foundation is that what? We are all sinners. We will all mess up. You married a sinner. Your spouse married a sinner. Well, I think, no, no, you're a sinner. You can think of your, you know, most perfect thing, most perfect thing out there. No, you're, you're a sinner and you need some help if you get your birth. So... This, uh, you know, this is obviously true in, uh, you know, in Christian families that mom and dad may be saved and all the children may be saved and you all may be saved, but you are all sinners. Everyone is, uh, you know, Christian moms struggle and they blow it sometimes, right? Christian, you know, uh, you know, Christian dads battle temptation. Christian dads make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Christian boys and girls and, and young people sometimes can act like little pagans, can't they? But we're all, you know, we are all sinners. We need to realize that. Something else that we need to realize is that we are all selfish. When the Lord confronted Adam about his sin, what do you think he did? It's that woman. It's all her fault. And what do you think she did? It's all that snake. It's the snake's fault. And then Adam got, you know, went even worse. He said, he said this way. He said, it's that woman that you gave me. <laughs> it's all, in other words, it's all your fault, God. Nina, you're, you're allowed to, like, help him and whatever you want to. Don't go for it, Nina. You know, we'll, all, we'll all turn to the side. We'll just go like this. Not only are we all sinners, but we're all selfish. You notice what happened in Genesis 3. It says in verse 21, it says, And unto Adam, 
also. Uh, to Adam also answered his wife, Did the Lord God make clothes of skin and clothe them? What's that? I mean, I mean, think about that. All this stuff that God makes them what? Uh, clothes of skin and he clothes them. This is what? A picture of salvation. This is a picture of salvation. That's a picture of grace. God covered their nakedness. God covered their sin. Not only are we all sinners, and you know we're all selfish, but we are all damaged goods. You guys are feeling kind of wonderful about yourselves, aren't you? Right now. Pastor, you call, me, you call me a sinner. You call me selfish, and now I can sit on damaged goods. But we're, you know what? Here's the thing: we're all salvageable. We're all salvageable. We're all. We are all saved by God's grace. God can change you. He can say, I'll, I'll go over there and I'll, and I'll hear him. But it's, it's, I mean, you may say that I'll go over there and I'll hear him, but it's not going to help our family. But let me tell you, God can do a work of grace in your life. God can do that work of grace in your family as well. He can, uh, you can be everything God intends you to be by his grace. A grace or your foundation. A family where grace is understood makes all the difference in the world. If you understand grace, then you can understand forgiveness. Grace means that you get what you don't deserve. Mercy means that you don't get what you deserve. You understand that? Grace means that you get what you don't deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve hell. We deserve the cross. We deserve all those things. We deserve those, but we don't get those. We get God's grace. Mercy God, means that you don't get what you deserve. Like I said, we deserve those things, but God's mercy says, you know what? You don't need those. You know, I'll take all those things. Um, we have Easter next week. Think about all those things. God's grace and mercy is personified by the cross. By his death, burial, and resurrection, God showed us grace. He showed us mercy. Along with that comes forgiveness. Why? Because we're all sinners, we're all selfish, and we're damaged goods. But God's grace comes in and can restore us and does restore us. I share this last point, and I think of the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. He had one of the, this boy had one of the greatest fathers a boy could have. That boy said, Father, give me the portion of goods that that falls to him. He proved that he was a sinner and proved that he was selfish with a broken heart. That old dad gave the boy his, his inheritance. And the boy took off to the far country. And you know what happened in the far country? The Bible says that he joined himself to the world. In other words, the same word that God uses says what God has joined together is the same word that is used here. That he says that he joined himself. In other words, that he glued himself. And you know that when you glue something together, when it's like super glue, what, you know, that when you want to separate those, you can't separate them perfectly. It's going to be damaged. And so, you know, as some of you are glued to the far countries, you are glued to this old world, you are glued to the standards and the morals of this old world, you have glued yourself to this ungodly world. It will happen to you just like it did to this to the son. It took him all the way down to the hawk and one day he came to himself and he said I don't deserve to be a son anymore but I would rather uh, I would be better off being a servant of my dad than to live here in the hawk pen. The son uh, came up out of the hawk pen and headed home. There at home was dad. The Bible says that he saw his son afar off. The boy got closer, and when the father went out and saw him, do you think that he said this? You sorry piece of trash. You embarrassed me, uh, you embarrassed me before my whole family. You embarrassed me at church. Don't you show your face around here. Go back where you came from. Is that what he says? Did he say that to his son? No. The son came back. He didn't deserve anything because, you know what? He took his inheritance. He wanted his father you know, to be dead, basically. He, didn't, he deserved judgment. He deserved hell, right? 
He starts making apologies. His father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He couldn't even finish the rest of his speech that he was going to do because the Bible says that the father put his arms around him and kissed him and put a robe on him and said, come on home, son, welcome back. That's what it means to have a grace-oriented family, that there are times when all of us need forgiveness. There are times when, when we don't need what we deserve. There are times when trans, you know, our transgressions are so great, our sins are so great, that forgiveness is difficult. That your children have done something, maybe the family, or maybe your father or your mother has done something so great, you said, I can never forgive them. You said, they don't deserve forgiveness. Maybe you had another situation where something ripped apart your family and said, that person doesn't deserve forgiveness. But you know what? This is a test in sorrow and you know, in repentance. When there is genuine repentance and remorse over sin, there should be room in our families for genuine forgiveness and restoration. If we have those situations in our family, we need to be like the father of the story. That no matter what maybe our kids have done, that no matter what our, you know, that our parents have done, that no matter what our grandparents or aunts or uncles have done, we need to you know, come before them and say, you know what, welcome home. If they come back and they're remorseful and, they, you know, and, they, uh, and they're repentant, they, they say, you know, I turn away from them, I'm so sorry. You know, I've done this. And they're you know, begging for your forgiveness. You need to come to them and you know what, and not hold that over to them. You need to wrap your arms around and say, welcome home, son. That's the way we need to be. That when our kids mess up, and they will. Because why? We mess up. We don't sit there and say, I told you so. If you were to just listen to me, do you not think that the child is already thinking about the way that you've already told them not to do this, and not to do that, and whatever? We just need to come to them and say, you know what, welcome home. If you want to build a, a, a family with a firm biblical foundation, you need to have a God right there that gives a family authority. You need to have a goal-oriented family that gives family unity. And you need to have a grace-oriented family that gives family beauty. So what's going on in your family? Are there needs that should be addressed today? Is there forgiveness that needs to be extended today? Are there confessions that need to be made today? Do you need to come and pray for your family? Do you need to come up to the altars or you know, pray with your family, you know, right where you're at, and pray with them, you know what, and, and just come and pray with them? Do you need to come to Jesus for salvation? If you're not saved, some of this may seem weird to you, but say, you know what, I want that. Then you need to come to the Lord. Are you that wayward son that I talked about, that, that prodigal son, and you need to come home today? If there are needs in your family or in your life, there is help in Jesus Christ. Come to him. Come to, you, uh, come to him this day and receive the help you need. Because God cares for you. He cares for what's going on in your life and in your family's life. Over the next few moments, I just want to give you that opportunity because oftentimes when we leave this place, we kind of like forget what the preacher just said. And I want us to be doers of the word, and not just hearers of the word. If there is issues in your family, then you need to talk it out, and you need to extend grace today. You need to extend forgiveness. So for the next few minutes, then if you could play some uh, music and, and cut the live stream and. Um, those next few minutes. If you need to come